welcome uh, to this uh, important uh, discussion topic this evening by journalist Andrew Nikiforp, um, the author of Energy of Slaves. Um, we are proud to be co-presenting with the TAI and SFU Van City Office of Community Engagement. My colleague in charge of community engagement, Andrew Halk, can't make it this evening, so I've stepped in. My name is Michael Boucher, and I run the cultural programs. He and I work a lot together. Uh, so we, in a way, have a blended approach to uh, political topics, discourse, as well as cultural issues. Um, we're, excited, we're very excited this year to be presenting an exciting cultural and community program. Um, this October the 17th, we have a Vancouver writer, John Valent, will be presenting a screening of Conflict Tiger, an award-winning documentary, which was the basis of his book, The Tiger. And in November, uh, we will be presenting a theatrical wizard and great storyteller, Robert Lepage, um, in Far Side of the Moon in the Fane Milton Wong from November the 1st to the 10th. Um, I encourage you, if you want to find out about our events listings, just to sign up. Go to sfuwoodwards.ca. Um, also, I'd just like to uh, suggest that you turn off your mobile devices for the courtesy of everyone. Um, I would like to now introduce the moderator for this evening. David Beers is the founding editor of the TAI and is adjunct professor of the University of British Columbia Graduate School of Journalism. I ask you to join me in welcoming David. Well, thanks very much. This is a, an incredible uh, privilege for me to be able to um, be in this beautiful place and to be able to listen to my esteemed colleague, Andrew Nikiforic, uh, and even converse with him um, in front of you. And uh, we've decided that we're going to edit out uh, the detours and the asides and the scurrilous things that we usually say when we talk to each other because I have the pleasure of editing uh, Andrew at the TAI. Um, I just want you to uh, imagine, let's say you are the, the, the housekeeper and, or uh, handyman to uh, uh, an artist. And uh, your job is to sort of go around the house and uh, keep things in order. And every once in a while you find this uh, beautiful piece of drawing lying there. And it's extremely well thought out, very carefully sketched. Beautiful in its own right, but um, over the days and months ahead, they just pile up. You keep finding these things lying all over the place. They seem too valuable to just not show them to the world, so you gather them up and you pin them to your bulletin board and you show everybody that comes by, look at this guy, he's, he's good. <laughs> and then one day, and let's, well, let's call this artist Mike, you know, and uh, one day somebody comes by and says, uh, Hey, have you seen what Mike's been up to? And you say, no, I've been actually wondering quite a bit. And they say, well, he's, come on down to the Vatican and have a look at the Sistine Chapel thing he's been working on. <clears throat> Basically, that's what it's been like to edit Andrew Nikiforic for the last three years, because Energy of Slaves is his Sistine Chapel. And along the way, uh, I've published, I don't know, maybe a couple hundred of your pieces. Um, it's a very good day at the Taiyu when we publish an Andrew Nikiforic piece on several levels. First of all, it's always extremely high quality. Um, secondly, it's very little work for me. It basically just comes in. I might fix a couple typos. Um, I think up a headline, and uh, we put it up. Uh, of course, we do our bit of fact-checking, but the point is Andrew has already done the research. He's footnoted it assiduously. Um, it's just highly professional work all the way. And then finally, the response it gets is phenomenal. Um, social media has given us a new way to be able to really track how uh, um, public intellectuals are taken up in the wider world. Um, when I started out as a journalist, uh, you would write something and you'd put it, and it would be published, and um, often it was a local publication. Uh, only people in that area would see it. And literally, that's what they'd say. They said, I saw your piece. I saw it. They never, you know, very few would say, I actually sat down and read the whole thing. They'd say, I saw it. So you didn't really know how much they'd invested in it, right? And, uh, you know, if you wrote in, in the Vancouver area, you didn't know if anybody back in Toronto was going to ever see it unless somebody carried it on an airplane and handed it to somebody. But nowadays, the minute something's up on the, on the Internet, 
you can tell not just whether people saw it, but whether it affected them so profoundly that they felt like other people needed to read it as well. And so we get that measurement through uh, Twitter, through uh, numbers of tweets and uh, Facebook recommendations. And Andrew is always just, he's just basically, he sort of breaks the meter when he publishes things. The first thing he ever published on the Tai, it had a headline something like what the, uh, I don't know what the legislative committee that wrote the Tar Sands report didn't want you to know because they basically spent weeks and months writing a report about the potential environmental hazards of the tar sands and then they shredded it. Wouldn't you like to know what was in it? Yeah, but how could you ever find out? Andrew found out. Andrew found out what was in it. He went back and found earlier drafts and reconstructed everything that was in that report and we published it on the Tai and it literally broke the meter. It was sort of like after a while when you get to a thousand tweets or a thousand Facebook recommends, it just sort of says 1K and then waits till the next K. Right, so you you know it goes in thousands of increments, and that was the first time we published Andrew, and it's been like that ever since. Um, so Andrew is now. Um, I'll tell you a few things about Andrew off the back of his book because I don't always remember all the things he's done. Um, he's one of, as I've just told you, he's one of North America's leading investigative journalists. He's written about education, economics, and the environment for the last two decades. His books include Pandemonium, uh, Saboteurs. Weibo Ludwig's War Against Oil, which won the Governor General's Literary Award for Nonfiction, and Tar Sands, which won the Rachel Carson Environment Book Award and became a national bestseller. When, when was Tar Sands published? 2008. 2008. And, you know, so that's an indication that, that Andrew has been on this beat for quite a while, and it hasn't been without um, some risks to him because uh, writing, uh, raising difficult questions about the Tar Sands in an emerging Petra state, which is Canada, with a rather small media world, is not a way to assure yourself of lots of writing assignments. I mean, it was to the Thais great benefit that Andrew <laughs> needed outlets after a while, after he had exposed enough inconvenient truths about the tar sands. Um, and that book became a national bestseller. His most recent book, Empire of the Beetle, was nominated for the Governor General's Literary Award for Nonfiction and selected as a top book of the year by both the Globe and Mail and Amazon.ca. And I use it when I teach uh, journalism at UBC because Andrew makes such fantastic use of narrative and storytelling. He's not a, a guy who just piles up dry facts. He doesn't have a hectoring, lecturing, scolding tone to his writing. He's a beautiful storyteller and, and um, the Pine Beetle is a book about a beetle. It's pretty hard if your central protagonist is an insect. And yet he managed to <laughs> introduce us to some pretty interesting people along the way, including one guy who decided he'd s he figured out how to solve the problem. All you have to do is play extremely loud rock and roll out in the woods, and, and the Pine Beetles would just die. <laughs> they never figured out how to actually do that, like how to, how to put enough speakers out in the entire forests of Canada in order to kill all the pine beetles, but apparently if we had been, been able to do that, we would have killed all the pine beetles. We would have used up all the oil and the tar sands to power the amplifiers. But <laughs> So Andrew now has become, I've told you that he, he, you know, he faced a bit of, of some, some uh, a bit of a rocky road at the beginning when he started writing, you know, exposing these truths about, about our relationship to energy and, and how the oil sands were we're uh, changing the very character of Canada and, and our national, the way, our, the way we imagine ourselves as a nation. But, uh, you know, Andrew has kept chipping away, and uh, because of the internet and because of his fantastic books, the world is now turning to Andrew and uh, recognize him at, recognizing him as an expert in um, energy policy and petropolitics. Um, he recently gave the presidential lecture uh, at, uh, in Missoula, Montana, at the University of Montana. Um, this particular book tour that he's been on, he's, he's spoken to National Public Radio, um, PRI. He's spoken in Ottawa and Toronto. The one um, unfortunate moment is he, he was slated to speak in Calgary, and um, he showed up there to speak, and it was a very, very small crowd, except uh, an oil executive rose from the back and threw his shoe at him, from what I understood. 
which I guess I'm, I'm told in that culture is, is considered a way to become a hero. And, and so actually it was a standing room only crowd in Calgary, which says a lot. Like, you know, because Andrew lives in Alberta, but, but uh, you know, he's also right in the middle of the, of the, of the oil patch. Um, Anyway, uh, the way the evening is going to go is Andrew's now going to um, basically give you the outlines of his of his uh, his thesis uh, for energy slaves, and uh, then we're going to uh, converse a bit, he and I, and I want to um, bring into the conversation uh, a series that Andrew's working on right now for the Taiyi, which is about transitioning from uh, fossil fuel dependency. How do we get from here to there? We're calling it the big shift for now. Um, that series will start up uh, later in, late in October, we, we think. Um, and, uh, and after we have our short conversation about that, then we'll open it up to questions from the audience. Um, and basically, a couple people here will bring microphones to you, and you'll be able to answer, ask your questions. So be formulating it while you think, uh, while, you, while you listen to them. Uh, so, uh, without any more, um, Andrew Nikiforic, welcome. Thank you very much, Dave, for, for those uh, kind and I think overly generous words. Um, uh, I also want to, I want to profoundly thank the Taiyi for, for making this, this evening possible. My publisher, Greystone Books, uh, I noticed my, Arthur, my uh, good editor there for my last three books, uh, Barbara Pulling, is here tonight. Um, she is an extraordinary and exceptional individual at keeping writers who sometimes get preoccupied with things clear and on a straight path. So thank you, Barbara. And then I also want to thank SUFU and um, the community, uh, your, your cultural community program for, for making this evening possible. Uh, and Am Joe Hall, who I understand put a lot of human energy into this event, and, and to thank you for taking time to, to come out. Because I have some, some rather disturbing, provocative, and, and new ideas to present to you about energy. You know, I live in a Petra state. I've lived there for more than 22 years. I dearly love my province, and I have wrestled with its character and its direction. And as a consequence of living in a Petra state, where you have, where everything is usually about one resource, um, I've had to think a lot about about energy or attitudes to energy. And the book I've written is, is essentially a moral and philosophical book. It is not an angry book. It is a book that is trying to explain why we are ignoring the global crisis we are in, why, as Canadians, we are ignoring the national crisis we face by becoming a major oil exporting nation, and why we fail to make the connections between this greater global economic stagnation, our national the, the, the fundamental changes to the national character already wrought by oil and our own consumption patterns. And uh, this led me ultimately to the radical notion that so many of our attitudes and ideas about energy and how we consume energy have all been derived from the very ancient institution of slavery, which was first and fundamentally an institution about shackling human muscle to get work done. The Greeks didn't care what color you were. The Romans didn't care what race you were from. They were after the muscle. And, and I believe that we have transferred those attitudes to our deployment of hydrocarbons as a feedstock for the energy machines that drive our culture today. So let's, let's get into it. <laughs> um, oil, there, there's no doubt that oil is, is, is the dominant energy uh, in the world today. And just take a quick look at this graph. And this kind of div divides up what we use and, and in what portions we use it. We're still using lots of coal, 25%. 
Are we still using lots of gas? Yes, in fact, gas consumption is going, natural gas consumption is going up 23%. Nuclear, about 6%. These are global figures. Biomass, 4%. Are we burning wood? Yes, we are burning wood. Hydropower, 3%. Solar, wind, geothermal, biofuels, less than 1%. And then you have oil, 37% of the power generated on this planet is coming from oil. The majority is obviously coming from hydrocarbons. And then when people ask me, well, is it going to be easy to defriend oil? I say, guys, just look at the graph. How are you going to go from more than 85% of your energy needs being powered by fuels into directly into energy slaves to renewables when renewables only make up 1% of what we know do? So you can see the scale of, of the problem. Here's another way to see the scale of the problem. This is pipeline infrastructure in the United States. And the United States, you must, you must remember, was the world's first oil pioneer. All right? they, did, they weren't the first to discover oil, but they were the first to deploy it, first as a, a source of illumination, and then as a lubricant, and then finally as a fuel for energy slaves. And that process started in 1859, just prior to the Civil War. And a lot of these pipelines, <laughs> they are more than 50 to 60 to 70 years old. So this is an extraordinary infrastructure that has locked in the system. And there are lots of people who will fight and die to preserve what they have invested in and what they own. Some of the world's most powerful corporations are all oil companies. Seven of the world's largest companies by revenue are oil. One of them is Sinopec. It's the world's seventh largest company. This is a state-owned operation, controlled, directed by the Communist Party of China. The people who work for big oil are among the most privileged people on the planet. They command among the highest salaries. And what you must remember about this institution is that it is capital intensive. It is not labor intensive. And the people who work for Big Oil are, as a result of their very, very large salaries, come to the immediate conclusion that they can command so much money for what they do that they are inherently smarter than the rest of us. A slaveholder's dilemma. Moreover, the countries that are now exporting oil, and there's about 90 of them on the planet, are in the master position. They control the master resource. But they are also subsidizing this resource to the tune of $700 billion a year so that their citizens can spend oil mindlessly. You go to Nigeria, go to Venezuela, go to Saudi Arabia, and you find that oil prices are entirely subsidized by the state. All right, let's go back a bit to, to, uh, to Rome, ancient Greece, to Egypt, 18th century the United States, 18th century uh, Brazil in the institution of slavery. So what did the Romans use slaves for? Well, they used them for everything. And what did they call them? Get this, they were called speaking tools. That's how they saw them. They saw them as tools that would help them get work done. And the whole object of slavery, of course, was that you employ a bunch of slaves, you take the surplus from their work to provide comforts in your own life. And so in ancient Rome, you had slaves with very specific jobs, slaves that would tend to the hearth. You had slaves that would um, um, entertain you. They were largely humpbacks and dwarfs. You had slaves that would um, do your legal work 
or you had slaves that would do medical work. You had slaves that would work in the plantations in Sicily and southern Italy growing grain. Um, you had slaves, you had in, in the streets of Rome, they had the, one slave in particular was called a nomenclator, and his job was to accompany the master down the street, and whenever you met somebody you didn't know, the nomenclator was there to remind you what their name was. Oh, by the way, this is, uh, you know, uh, Don so-and-so. And, and uh, uh, so you had a walking GPS unit with you uh, to, you know, keep you, uh, you know, yeah, so this is so-and-so, and yes, and by the way, we're in downtown Rome right now, and, you know, in five minutes from now, we will be at the restaurant. And um, so, uh, and, 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 and if a slave owned a slave, that person was known as vicarious. All right, and the slaves that escaped, and there was a, that was a huge problem because they'd always created energy shocks and so on, then those slaves were called fugitives. And what do we call emissions from gas plants and oil plants that escape? We call them fugitive emissions. We are not as intent as the Romans in capturing those emissions as the Romans were their slaves. All right, so that this was a, a very important institution in Rome. It was the dominant institution, and as a result, there was no discussion about its morality. It was considered a necessity. And, you know, even people like Aristotle and Plato, the great philosophers, and, you know, enormously important thinkers, they did not question the energy institution that provided their comforts and made their life possible. And in fact, there was no questioning of, of slavery until hydrocarbons made that conversation possible, and we'll get to that. So here's what the Romans had to say about slavery. Here's Pliny. We use other people's feet when we go out. We use other people's eyes to recognize things. We use another person's memory to greet people. We use someone else's help to stay alive. The only things we keep for ourselves are our pleasures. Now, does that remind you of anyone in North America? Now along comes this, uh, so we're, we're going to skip ahead here now and talk about a remarkable development, um, a, a new energy slave that came on the market in the 18th century, uh, developed by uh, a remarkable Scotsman by the name of James Watt. And the whole idea of this is a lifting machine, uh, this is a steam engine powered by coal, and the object here was to pump water out of coal mines that were flooding too quickly. And so Watt came up with a solution, this machine that could do the heavy lifting, that could do the heavy pumping, that would make it possible to mine more coal to fire more steam engines. And this invention rapidly changed the British uh, experience and the European experience. And so by 1824, England's steam engines puffed out 26,000 horsepower, the equivalent of nearly seven. 750,000 men or 100,000 horses, and by 1880, steam engines had added 3 billion inanimate slaves to the global economy. Now, it was this development in European life that quietly and subversively supported the abolitionists and made it politically and economically possible to outlaw human slavery, of course, which we've never completely outlawed. In fact, uh, many petro-states have uh, enormous slave populations, um, as well do oil importing states such as China. Um, so, but, but this was a fundamental development behind abolition. Thomas Clarkson, one of the great abolition leader, and by the way, it took only 14 people to meet in a room in the 1770s to decide that slavery was wrong, was sinful, an affront to God, and within 50 years, they had created the most powerful social movement on earth, and it ended that practice uh, in Europe. So when any of you feel any ounce of despair or helplessness, just remember that 14 people can change the world. So. Thomas Clarkson, how did Samuel Coleridge, the poet, refer to him? He called him my moral steam engine. All right, so coal fires the British Empire, gives it 
and accept this, this sense of exceptionality and arrogance, and England uses its coal-fired power and its steam engines and this enormous flow of energy that, that came from all of this to create its empire and conquer the world. And then along comes the United States, and the United States encounters this substance, oil, another hydrocarbon, with, with even a greater capacity to do work than coal, cheaper, uh, more portable, and here we are in the Pennsylvania oil fields, the great oil region of the United States, which in its day, in the 1850s, 1860s, 1870s, was experienced the equivalent of the gold rush in San Francisco. If you're a young man and you wanted to make your fortune, this is where you went. And look how close the, the derricks were to each other. And there were daily fires. There were gas explosions. There was one episode where there was a fireball erupted, and, and the men that were caught in that fireball then, as one guy described it, ran out of it like Roman candles aflame. So anyone who thinks that the oil and gas industry is this very quiet, well-ordered uh, uh, machine need, any, need only look at its history to realize it was an incredibly violent, incredibly explosive, and an and, and eco economically crude force wherever it appeared. And of course, I, mean, I can say a lot about oil, but the really important thing here is that it was, first was an illuminant, then a lubricant, and then finally uh, as a feedstock for energy slaves. And the first energy slave, that, of course, was, was the car. And here's what's really, what really freaked me out when I was writing this book. I realized that 40% of the names for automobiles all directly come from this slave tradition of ours. You know, so we called our automobiles patrician, we called it the power master, because it allowed us to do and behave and live like the emperors, the pharaohs, the czars of old. But instead of having 20 people trot us down the street, we could now get in a machine with uh, triple quadruple that horsepower or that manpower and go for a hell of a joyride. And we did. The Americans immediately fell in love with the car. And it changed the entire American experience. And um, um, it took a while, but, but nonetheless it, it, it did. And with the consequence that American cities became reoriented around their energy machines. And they also became increasingly more polluted and less livable, which in turn drove the creation of suburbia, uh, which in turn you know, uh, drove them one of the greatest mass migrations or movements of, of, of people in, in, in North American history from urban cores to these uh, suburban dreams. The same time that oil started invading all aspects of, of American life, it, it also changed the nature of, uh, of, of economics because you've got cheap feedstock, you've got energy machines that are then making cheap stuff all over the place, right? And, and economists then, who used to be moral philosophers and used to think largely about stuff and people and sunshine and crops and, and all that sort of stuff, are now thinking, well, it's all about markets and capital, isn't it? Because we've got all this cheap stuff all running amok and, and the point is to, See so who can make the cheapest of the cheap stuff and sell it the most and make the most money. And, and, and they started thinking as though energy was not involved in economics. Um, so here's one of the most popular uh, economists in the United States, a Yale economist, no doubt, big man on Wall Street, wrote columns, advised people. 1929, he was telling Americans the stock market will we'll, we'll continue to go on forever. Uh, and like every other frigging economist since then, has failed to have any predictive value whatsoever. Um, you know, lost his shirt practically during the Great Depression. And, uh, but nevertheless, was still said, you know, look, my, my models are all just fine. This was his model of the American economy. You know, you push a button here and pull another knob here, and somebody gets rich and somebody gets poor, and you know, but it, so if you, therefore you're not really pushing the right knobs, you've got to put the right, push the right knobs, and then you'll get a middle class, and, and, and this is the kind of thinking that has got us into enormous trouble. Now, at the same time that you had people like Fisher, uh, 
uh, really spouting a lot of bullshit about economics. You then had um, uh, this guy, now, Frederick Soddy. Now here's somebody who actually knew something about energy. He was a nuclear pioneer. He was um, an incredible thinker on, on many terms. He, his involvement in the development of nuclear energy early in the 1920s convinced him that we didn't have the maturity or wisdom to use this power wisely. And so as a scientist, he had a moral crisis. And so then he started writing about economics because he thought that the economists were not telling the full story. He said, look, this story is about energy. And he said, look, if the supply of energy failed, modern civilization would come to an end as abruptly as the music of an organ deprived of wind. And he said, you know what? Wealth is a flow, and it cannot be saved. And he was called a crank. He was largely ignored. And yet some of the most important works on economics and what economics is truly about comes from a man who understood physics and the atom. And that's Frederick Soddy. And believe me, you're going to hear a lot about him in the next five to 10 years, as every other prediction by modern economists wedded to false mathematics is failing all around us. And then what else do the Americans do with their oil besides poisoning their economic thinking and, and creating this myth that you know, we're a linear culture and exponential growth will go on forever and, 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 you know, and, and we subtract any discussion of energy from, from this? Well, here's Norman Borlaug, you know, a rather remarkable scientist, with Rockefeller money, you know, big oil, goes to Mexico, develops a way to turn low-yielding grains into high-yielding grains using high infusions of energy. Lots of water, lots of, uh, of, of fertilizer, and he becomes the father of the Green Revolution, and the Chinese and the Indians and the Africans are told, this is the way of the future, where you concentrate more energy in the heads of plants that will grow shorter and produce more grain, provided you water the hell out of them and fertilize them like there is no tomorrow. Provided you have cheap energy to do that forever and ever and ever. And it is a system that is failing throughout the globe as we move to extreme hydrocarbons and the price of all this stuff goes up. And in Pakistan and throughout uh, the Punjab, the people who are committing the most suicides are farmers because they cannot manage this way. They cannot afford the inputs for their crops. And then, what, of course, when you change the whole energy flow in the very way you produce food, it makes it possible to, food, to, to produce so much cheap food. I mean, what were the statistics this week on how much food we waste? A third of the food that we produce ends up in the garbage. I cannot think of another culture on the planet before ours that would regard that as sensible, sane, or acceptable. But cheap fuel, standardized process, lots of waste. And in the process, we, we seem to be changing our shape and our size. Um, cheap food, fast food, fat people. And then there's this, this, this conception that somehow, all right, well, we've got our digital stuff now. Or just think here for a moment. The Industrial Revolution was about the mechanization of muscle. And we did that with hydrocarbons feeding energy slaves or machines of various kinds and sizes, from lawnmowers to chainsaws to you name it, from stuff to, you know, I like my chainsaws, so I don't, but, but on, and on we go. But nonetheless, they are there, and they're doing work for us. And then we start the digital revolution, which we somehow think is something different. I'm sorry, it, it's part of the, the same process. It's taking high energy inputs, making a new class of machines that are all about the mechanization of mental activity. So we can get dumber, more incompetent, and fatter. We can become wallies, uh, you know, or, or I know the the creatures that appalled Wally. And how extraordinary is that? And we're not we, we're not even conscious of it. We just think, well, this is the way to go, isn't it? And these chips, this, a chip like this, a handful of microchips that power your machines, your digital equipment, can have as much embedded energy as a car 
And enough power was used to power a 30 watt laptop nonstop for 1,000 days. So the energy needed to produce these energy slaves is purely a conceit of high energy spending. This is not a movement to conservation or efficiency. This is another step up the energy level in terms of the complexity of the society we are constructing. Now one last thing I want to just throw out here because I think this is on everyone's mind, particularly with the Enbridge pipeline and with uh, the startling direction that Stephen Harper has taken the Canadian government in terms of its attacks on environmentalists, its attacks on science and scientific evidence, its, uh, its avoidance of any discussion on climate change, its total lack of moral leadership, as well as the fundamental sellout to the Communist Party of China in terms of, of oil. And so, How do you understand this? How does this work? Well, let me tell you, I come from a place where it has worked for 42 years, where we've had one party in power for 42 years, and you go to any petro state, and the one thing you learn very quickly is that oil money can, can, uh, can preserve the shelf life of a political party long, be long beyond its expiration date. All right? 42 years in Alberta. The Democratic Party ruled Texas for 70 years. The Republicans are now on a 30-year roll. We call that democracy. Uh, you know, uh, Gaddafi ruled Libya for 42 years. The PRI ruled Mexico on the basis of its oil wealth for 70 years. So petro states are not ordinary states. They're dysfunctional in the whole scheme of things because of the flow, not just because of the resource, but it's because of the flow of the money. So the first thing a petro state does is lower taxes. They want to make you feel comfortable about living in a petro state, but then they don't tell you what's uh, the fine print on the back side. If you're not paying taxes, you're not going to be represented. Who will be represented? Those who are paying the largest bills. In Alberta, it's 30% of our revenue comes from big oil, from hydrocarbons. Who does our government represent? Alison Redford does not represent Albertans. She represents the resource sector. So that's what happens when you, and, and you know, Wyoming, no taxes. Texas, no taxes. Louisiana, no sales tax. Middle East, no sales tax. The same, Alaska, same thing. The same deal, the same compromise is made everywhere. And then you, these governments typically overspend. Alberta's running about a $5 billion deficit at the, mon uh, at the moment. Go figure. We're supposed to be these smart people out west sitting on a pile of hydrocarbons. But sitting on a pile of, of anything has never made anyone smart. And then uh, <clears throat> we have to concentrate power. This is another phenomenon that you see in almost every petro state because you have the money and the machinery to do so. You tighten the reins and you make sure that the political discourse is limited, that there is more secrecy, that there is less transparency, and God forbid if somebody should come along and ask about the money, and who's getting the money, where is it going, and how much is being saved. Don't want to have that conversation in this country. And then, of course, the hallmark of every Petro state is that is their incompetence. They think that government is all about uh, uh, you can solve every problem by throwing some petrodollars at it. These are governments, you know, good governments are governments that rely on taxes, and taxes are generally scarce, and therefore they have to be innovative, they have to be smart, they have to be uh, proactive, they have to plan, they have to be creative. It is scarcity that drives innovation and creativity. It is not abundance. So what happens in Tetra states? Well, when taxation is absent, populations tend to be politically inactive, relatively obedient, and surprisingly loyal. And there's Terry Lynn Carl, a marvelous political scientist at Stanford University, who is pretty well defining the character of my fellow Albertans. And then along comes this guy. <laughs> and he is from Alberta. He is the son of an imperial oil executive. He is a libertarian. So he's, uh, he's up there with Fisher in terms of his economic theories and points of view. He's a desperate man because Alberta has overproduced its bitumen. Since 1998, we've produced, we have approved more than 100 projects 
uh, both mines and in situ projects, and as a consequence, we have flooded the American market with bitumen and driven down the price by $20 a barrel. Now, how smart is that? How creative is that? Um, you know, you don't need much public policy to make mistakes like that. And it never occurred for the, either the Alberta government or the Canadian government to have any intelligence on oil consumption south of the border, which has been declining steadily for the fa last five years in a row, not because the Americans don't love oil any less, but because they are finding it increasingly uh, uh, more difficult to afford to buy. You know, when you stand at a gas station in Phoenix, Arizona, and watch people come in, and I'm trying to figure out how to use the digital uh, pump there, and looking like a, an idiot at the, and all these guys are coming by, and they're pumping in gas into their cars, two to three dollars worth of gas, you gotta think, my God, has the American experience come to this? And that's all the cash they had in their pockets for their energy slaves that day. So, here we are then, we have a desperate government, has, has over um, um, approved uh, projects, we've got too much bitumen on the market, and we think the solution now is, okay, why don't we build a pipeline across northern BC, we'll stuff that down the throats of those, those people there, you know, uh, they're all probably smoking too much dope and they won't notice, and, uh, and then, you know, okay, and then we'll get the Communist Party of China to uh, take all this stuff. We'll, do, we'll strip it and ship it, and uh, this, will be, this will be our solution. And, you know, and Canadians won't notice. And then we'll sign a trade deal with the Communist Party of China, and we'll, uh, we'll sign it in Russia, and then we'll table it here in Canada. I hope nobody notices what Elizabeth Nain noticed. And... Um, and uh, and then when she asks for public discussion on this trade agreement, the government says, no, we won't do that because we're now a petro state, and the last thing we really want to see is any transparency in a petro state. And, and here's what one of the top legal experts on trade deals has to say about it. The Canada-China deal undermines basic Canadian principles of public accountability and open courts. It raises dramatically the stakes of Chinese takeovers in the resource sector. If ratified, it will tie the hands of future elected governments for at least 31 years. And here again is another dynamic at play with oil about masters and slaves. You know, what was it that Peter Lougheed reminded us? Behave like an owner, collect your fair share, save for a rainy day, go slow, add value, clean up the mess. I have not heard a single friggin' politician in this country repeat that refrain as a as public policy that might work for Canadians as well as Alberta. All right, let me wrap up here quickly. So the United States is now in trouble, and it spends on average a billion dollars a day importing oil, either from uh, right-wing libertarian countries such as Canada to the north, um, or uh, or political uh, and religious extremists in the Middle East. Um, as a consequence, the American experience is becoming a shrinking one and ever more conflict laden. You know, going up the energy ladder was one hell of a ride. Coming down it is going to be one hell of a bumpy experience. And no culture on the planet has ever chosen voluntarily to come down its energy ladder. But here we have now 30 to 40 million homes like this, McMansions, by the way. Um, they, one of the characteristics of slaveholders was they all built big homes. And they were all massively in debt. And here's uh, Dave uh, Graber, great anthropologist. If Aristotle were magically transported to the United States, he would conclude that most of the American population is enslaved because for him the distinction between selling yourself, and this was a common thing in the old days, if you were in debt, you wanted to get out of it, you'd become a slave. And in so doing, you become socially dead to the world. That's what it meant to be a slave. Because for him, the distinction between selling yourself and renting yourself is at best a legalism. We've managed to take a situation where most people in the ancient world would have recognized as a form of slavery and turned it into the definition of freedom. And then we see this incredible polarizing division in American life between red states and blue states 
between hydrocarbon producing states and oil importing states in the United States. So look at this map carefully, look at the red states, and then look where the hydrocarbons are. Do you want to understand the politics of the United States? You have to understand its geology. Our hydrocarbons are becoming ever more extreme. Bitumen, deep shore, deep, shore, deep uh, sea um, drilling, hyd um, hydraulic fracking with shale gas. These are all extreme and desperate events. These are, you know, we, have, we, are, we are, you know, this is a, a baseball game in the ninth inning. And one of the great signatures of this is the surplus. Every civilization lives on its energy surplus, whether it's a surplus of slaves or the surplus generated by the proliferation of billions of energy slaves fed by, by hydrocarbons. So at the turn of the century, it took one barrel of oil to make 100 more. That's like having $1 and making $100 with it. In the tar sands, the returns are like this. It takes one barrel of oil and the returns are five. For the steam plants, the returns are one or one or one on two. That's exactly the returns you get for most biofuels. You cannot run a civilization that we now have on those kind of returns. The world's oil production is stagnating. It is not going up anymore. It is plateaued and flattening out. And then we wonder why oil consumption, but, but at the same time, the price of oil has gone dramatically up. And then we wonder why the economies of Europe and Japan and the United States are stagnating. And then we talk to someone like Joseph Tainter, a great anthropologist in the United States at Utah, and just look at the white part at the bottom here. Because of the connection of energy to problem solving, we will not stop using fossil fuels until we are forced to. And then we all know we have to go on some kind of energy diet. I mean, that is obvious. But let me just add with, 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 with two or three final thoughts here. Because everyone is asking, well, Andrew, what's the future going to be? I have no friggin' idea what the future is going to be. And when any, anyone tells you they know what the future is going to be, um, then they are probably an expert of some sort. And, um, and I realized as a journalist a couple years ago that I've spent much of my life quoting these so-called experts. And I go back and, you know, and check to see if anything they said actually ever came true. And you realize that most of it never did. And then I say, oh my God, so I've been responsible for much of my life for promoting a hell of a lot of misinformation and pure straight bullshit from people who have called themselves experts. <laughs> About 90 to 80, and they've now done the studies that 80 to 90% of what these guys say, or gals, but it's mostly guys, is, uh, is wrong. You know? And it's, you wonder then why people are turned off the media. Well, because it's not reliable, it's not truthful. Um, so, um, a few thoughts. So where are we going in the future? I don't know. I can tell you this. Energy transitions, and, and, and this I'll really point out in my series for the TIE, they are unpredictable, they are protracted, and they are uncertain, and they are often heavily conflict-laden. And that those that control the dominant forms of energy will be loath to give up ground on any front in any way. The second thing I can say, all right, so where are we headed? I don't know, but I think a lot of individuals, a lot of communities are making up their own mind. They're saying, man, this is getting pretty damn complicated. I can't afford all these damn slaves, and I don't like the political dynamics at work here. And, uh, and they have started in slowly to walk away or opt out or change their lives in fundamentally different ways. And what I see them doing is that they are employing fewer slaves. So they're asking themselves the big moral and philosophical questions. How many slaves am I entitled to? And what am I using them for? And what fuels will I use? Um, then uh, I, there, there's this, uh, you know, high spending culture is all about quantity and cheap stuff and cheap shit. And so they're saying, you know what? I'm gonna choose quality. I don't want quantity in my life anymore. I don't want to be flooded by stuff I cannot use. I don't want to be one of these people who, when I die, they want to burn the house because there's so much junk in there, they don't know what to do with it. 
Um, and then there's the, the movement towards small things. When stuff gets out of control, it's too big. You want to rescale things, simplify things, bring them down to a human scale. And that means having fewer machines again in your life. It is realizing the importance of human energy and human muscle. And I'm not talking about slavery here. The greatest issue facing um, Europe after the collapse of Rome was that nobody wanted to work with their hands because manual work was associated with the brutality of slavery. And so uh, one of the great things that St. Benedict did was to resurrect the idea that working with your own hands and your own muscle was a beautiful way to restore your own vitality. And to do that in communities was a powerful way to change the world. Another thing is to be present, not to be distracted. So turning off these machines. Being placed as opposed to being mobile. Being committed, being prepared to defend your place in the world. The idea that, oh, I can destroy this place and move on to another place and destroy it and then buy a big house in Vancouver Island and retire. That idea should be discarded. So small versus big. Being placed as opposed to being mobile. Quality as opposed to quantity. Being present as opposed to distracted. Living more and consuming less. And that's the kind of future that I'm certainly looking forward to. Thank you. Everybody feeling really happy right now then? Or? <laughs> Um, thank you. That's, there's a lot to think about there, and I, I, I will pose myself a bit as devil's advocate at the beginning. Please. I'm going to put myself in that room of 14 people who wanted to end slavery. And if somebody had offered me this deal, that we could pull rocks out of the ground or dead, mushy dinosaurs out of the ground and convert them to the power that we were using humans to do, I would have taken that deal in a, in a minute. Mm -hmm. I mean, do you, I, I'm just trying to read your, you know, how much approbation you're placing on those who created our energy economy. Well, I think it was a very human thing to do. The mistake we made was that, this, all right, let's get rid of slavery. This is great. This is a fantastic thing. But then as the machines proliferated in European life, we saw powerful social and economic dislocations taking place. You had the countryside being emptied of people. You saw men tethered to machines the way slaves had been shackled in the fields. Uh, we had children working in workshops. Um, we had uh, uh, enormous problems with this industrial Revolution, um, and uh, and 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 what is interesting when you go back and you read nineteenth-century philosophers and thinkers, and someone like John Ruskin, who I heartily recommend that if you if you want to read something really delightful and um, it is always great to read a nineteenth-century mind um, because those books are have a flow to them that a modern book will never have that is written on a computer. So John Rushkin's concern, and, and he was in favor of abolition and emancipation, but he was also concerned about the new emerging servitude. And he was concerned about what mechanization would do to the human soul, what mechanization would do in particular to human vitality. And then there was another really great American historian by the name of Henry Adams, um, who wrote a remarkable essay addressed to school teachers, no less, I think in 1904, 1906. And he had the same concern. He said, look, we've, we've unleashed this phenomenal amount of energy that is coming from, from these fossils. 
and then we're putting it in, converting it into these machines, and we're generating all this enormous heat and power, but we don't have the ability or the wisdom to manage that power. And what is going to happen when we can no longer run these machines? And he was talking about entropy, and he was talking about the tendency of, re of diminished returns over time and of machines growing old and dying. And, or as Bruce Springsteen would put it uh, in, in his great song, uh, you know, 57 channels and nothing on. But somebody might argue, okay, you're confusing, um, Andrew, you're confusing the machines and the oil that drives them with the political structure that then uh, set about um, organizing the way that energy was used. That, that you know, it's, it's similar to the critique that there's enough food in the world. The problem isn't, you know, uh, we're not growing enough food or we grow food the wrong way. The, the problem is we don't distribute it properly. Right? So I guess my point would be, are you saying that um, democracy is just not up to the task of, of, of uh, helping us through uh, the, big, the big social decisions that need to be made around uh, diminishing fossil fuels and, and our energy slave economy? Are you saying democracy has peaked, it's not up to the task, or are you saying Democracy is the solution. We just don't have enough of it. Um, I'm, I'm fund fundamentally saying that democracy is peaked and it's not up to the task. I think there are two tasks here. One is, the first fundamental question is, um, are, are we up for all this high energy spending? Do we know how to, to, to do this? Um, and then the second question is about equity. Well, there, there's, there's nothing equitable about how energy has been spent on this planet for the last 150 years. I mean, North Americans, well, I mean, we're the masters in terms of spending. And the rest of the world have, uh, have been the slaves li living with the emissions. And, um, you know, the average North American consumes 24 barrels of oil a year, and that's equivalent in pure energy terms to having at your beck and call 89 energy slaves. Um, in China, it's about two to three barrels and rising. In India, it's about one to two barrels and rising. In Africa, it's half a barrel. Um, Japan and Europe would be around 16, 15 barrels and dropping. Um, so the question of equity is one that we've never wanted to address. The question of what do we do with all this energy, how do we spend it truly to, to become better human beings, that is a question we haven't addressed. Now, democracy, it, and, and again, and, and so much of what I'm saying in this book, I'm, I'm kind of sketching things out. I'm not sure I'm all right, right? But I'm sketching out these ideas. It's interesting to me that there fundamentally were no democracies in Europe prior to 1750, you know, perhaps with the exception of Iceland. Um, and largely that had to do with the fact that energy was scarce, and you needed these monarchs, you needed these czars, you needed these emperors to direct and control energy um, in, uh, in, in a very authoritarian ways. And you also need those kind of governments to control the movement of indentured labor. And then with the introduction of coal and the steam engine, what we gradually see is this political revolution, much the same, way that abolition occurred, much the same way the labor movement then occurred, where we're saying we're, we're, so much energy is on the loose. The average guy now has access to power he never had before. That there's a solution to deal with that. Well, maybe we need to open things up a bit. And maybe each and every man, now that they now are beginning to have the same amount of power as a king or a czar uh, in terms of the machines they are working with, Maybe that's, that's what we should do. And, and so democracy you know, sort of becomes this, this companion to high energy spending. But now we sort of peaked with our spending. We are so distracted by our spending that we've even forgotten what it means to be a citizen. You know, the original position of the United States was, and, and the vision of its founding fathers 
was that Americans would be a communal people, they would be an independent people, a self-sufficient people, a self-reliant people. Um, and that vision got distracted, distorted, and pulled away with, by hydrocarbons. And I, I don't think anyone here would, would you know, if, when you look south of the border, there's a, there's, a, there's a hell of a mess brewing there. And, and so... Um, but let me, let me interrupt you there and okay. say that both presidential candidates have that salt. I don't know if you've been listening. <laughs> both of them have declared that within 20 years, the United States will be energy independent. Now, uh, I think I know some of the, I mean, I, the first thing that they, that most, I think both of them are basing this on is, is the incredible um, newly discovered uh, frackable resources of natural gas, right? So I, your whole thesis that we're running out of our ability to tap new energy and spend energy and, 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 and run our energy <coughs> slaves, energy, it's wrong because both Mitt Romney and uh, and Barack Obama say we're going to be energy dependent in 20 years. I think every president has said that since <laughs> President Eisenhower. I mean, I remember Nixon saying that when I was a kid in the United States, saying we're going to become energy independent in uh, 10 years, and it never happened. And uh, uh, and you know, it, and and the Americans think their solution right now is drill, baby, drill. What they have not configured into the equation is that these hydrocarbons are more expensive. They are more carbon intensive. They are more complicated to produce and require ever higher levels of upgrading and refining. And, um, and that the American economy was not based on expensive oil. It was built on cheap oil. And that is the problem that Americans have to face. It is not that America is going to run out of oil, although its oil production peaked in 1972, and ever since then the American experience has been, been challenged by its dependence on Middle Eastern oil and by the, the trillions of dollars Americans have spent trying to defend that oil supply, which really much more wisely should have been put into other things. Um, the only institution in the United States that gets all this at this point in time is the American military. And every branch of the American military has plans for a transition to renewables of one kind or another to decrease their reliance on fossil fuels. They see it fundamentally as a security risk to the United States. And by the way, the US military also takes climate change much more seriously than Stephen Harper ever will. But, it, but if they believe they can make that transition, why are you so pessimistic about society kind of maintaining the comforts that we have now? So, for example, obviously we've become I'm, I'm more... Not, I'm not being pessimistic, Dave. Well, let, let me just say, obviously we've become I'm more... I'm being realistic. Okay, we've okay. become more, more, more... Why must you... Why must your realism force me to be so pessimistic? <laughs> Because I am now. Um, no, I mean, uh, we've become, you know, sure, we were spendthrifts and, you know, we were young and we had lots of oil, but now we're older and we're smarter and uh, aren't we going to be more innovative and therefore, um, given the amount of waste that you pointed out, can't we run the same society in about half as much energy with just a bit of innovation? I'm not sure about the innovation part, but we can certainly run a society using much less energy than, than we are. I mean, I mean, the really good news story here is that when you talk to some of the, the world's really smart energy thinkers, and, uh, and uh, uh, like Vaclav Schmil at the University of Manitoba, and here's a, a fast-talking guy from Czechoslovakia <laughs> who seems to write a book every year. You know, I kid, I kid you not. A man is absolutely f brilliant. He was a very good friend of the American uh, Republican ecologist Garrett Hardin. And um, so Schmill says, look, all of this talk about the need for more energy is completely wrong. Our problem is we don't know how to use the energy we have, and we can be much happier consuming much less. 
And he looked at all the research and he found actually there was no association uh, with high energy consumption and happiness, no association with high energy spending and democracies, none whatsoever. Um, and uh, and that, that some of the happiest people on the planet consume barely a fraction of, of what we consume. And their joy and their vitality comes uh, from using human energy, not as in slavery, but from family energy, communal energy, doing things together, and, and concentrating on the quality of one's life as opposed to the quantity of stuff in it. So that's the really good news. The really good news is, is, is right there staring us in the face. And so someone like Jeff Rubin then says the new green is you know, not necessarily about wind powers and solar panels and geothermal, it's about using fewer and fewer hydrocarbons and, and, and using them where we really need them to do some legitimate heavy lifting um, as opposed to just gratuitous spending. So there's a, there's a lot that we can do there. Now, here, here comes the caveat. So let's say we get more efficient. Okay, we don't waste as much and we're much more efficient. And there's something called Jevons paradox. So every time we get more efficient, we tend then to consume that efficiency. <laughs> um, and um, so, you know, we, we, it, it kind of works this way it, in the sense that, all right, so we make cars a little more efficient, they go a little bit farther, uh, and, um, but then we drive a little bit more as a consequence. And that has tended to be the phenomenon that every time we have improved the efficiency of some energy slave or device, then we ended up consuming more of it. Perfect example would be the TVs, the digital gadgets, the computers in your home, which you all bring in thinking, aren't these marvelous energy saving devices, when in fact the average con energy consumption in Canadian homes is now rising as a consequence. Yeah, I, w I, once, I was writing a piece about um, how we might not be able to fly anymore because, or, or we won't be able to fly for pleasure anymore, or just, you know, holidays because the price of oil will be so expensive and I and I did use some of this military research to base that on but I thought I had kind of a neat way to to get us out of it I, I contacted William Gibson who's a famous science fiction writer and thinker about the future and I said I already had my idea worked out and I just wanted him to say it so I said you know Bill don't you think Basically, we'll all stay at home and we'll kind of live on the internet. We'll, you know, we'll all visit places, little virtual worlds. And he said, I don't know, Dave. And he's got sort of kept, hung on to his West Virginia accent a little bit, which is kind of jarring here in Vancouver to hear sometimes. <laughs> he says, I don't know, I've just been looking into that. And uh, you know how much energy it takes to keep a, an avatar alive? In a, <laughs> As much as a lower middle class family in Brazil, apparently all the servers running that keep these virtual worlds going, they consume a lot of energy. Better, so, yeah. um, but, that, but then, you know, <laughs> that brings me to nuclear. That'll get us out of it, right? Ah. <laughs> <laughs> uh. <laughs> Yes. We can just just yeah. Uh, okay. Uh, can we turn that just yeah? Or maybe I should just go over and turn it off. Or at least make him start doing push-ups or something. <laughs> <laughs> How about if I? <laughs> there we go. All right. Ah. <laughs> All right, so the question is, what about nuclear? Nuclear will surely save us, and, and uh, that's certainly what we thought in the 1950s, 60s, and 70s, when, when, and, and nuclear was largely the product of a lot of people thinking, well, what are we going to do when we run out of cheap oil? And the answer was, well, geez, let's, let's take these atoms and let's, uh, let's you know, make the world's uh, uh, niftiest form of energy. Well, we just, we'll have enormous amounts of energy at our fingertips, and as you know, as cheap as, as uh, candy in a store. And of course, none of that really came to be. It turned out to be the world's most expensive form of energy. All right, so you, you can't build nuclear energy without subsidizing the hell out of it. Um, so that's one issue. 
and at extraordinary cost. It takes a long time to develop. We're talking, you know, 5, 10, 15, 20 years. Almost every nuclear plant that has been built recently has all come in, um, you know, way over budget. It is complicated technology that requires uh, a class of scientific priests to manage. We know by the performance of this industry in Japan that there is a tendency among this priesthood towards larceny and, um, and, and, uh, and just sheer uh, falsehoods. Then there's the issue of waste. What do you do with the waste from this uh, process? Whether it's 10,000 years or 100,000 years, that's an enormous legacy for other generations. And um, so it, it is not going to save us. It, it is not really waiting in the wings. I'm not arguing that we should entirely abandon it. We just don't know how to use it wisely yet. We might never learn how to use it wisely. Um, Jim Hansen, the great climate scientist in the United States, thinks maybe third, fourth generation nuclear power plants, we might get there. We might get to a point where we've solved the waste problem, where we solve the scale problem, where um, maybe that's possible, uh, maybe it's not. Um, let me ask you this then. Uh, I'm, I've now that you've knocked away every um, glimmer of hope that I've that I've <laughs> held on to. <laughs> let me ask a totally self-serving question: um, How do you think that this uh, high-energy, highly dependent on energy slave economy has shaped journalism? And if we can't have that anymore, what's going to happen to me? <laughs> well. <laughs> <laughs> I don't know about you, Dave, but I'm, 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 I'm going to be working somewhere else. <laughs> uh, uh, media is in a fantastic transition, as, as we, I think we all know and all realize, as uh, newspapers are, are shrinking. Um, and what we have seen in the media is the same thing we've seen in almost every aspect of high energy living. You see the concentration, you see standardization, you see this relentless mechanization. And it took me a long time to kind of figure out um, what um, Noam Chomsky was about when he was talking about the media and fact manufacturing consent. And then I realized that what he was really talking about, okay, well, uh, what do you, we do in the media? Okay, well, we're working with machines all day. You know, with printers, teleprompters, all these energy slaves. And then we are engineering a bunch of information and refashioning it. And this is a, a process subject to all kinds of editing and standardization and, and, um, and then we're, you know, then we have to make sure it's entertaining and, and you know, and uh, then you, you realize that it is actually, it's a very mechanical process. It's a very industrial process. And then look at the product, and you know, and I wonder, okay, why is it that people have really stopped reading a lot of this stuff? Well, th it's the same reason that they've stopped buying a lot of hamburger meat lately. <laughs> yeah, <laughs> it's contaminated. <laughs> um, so, where is it going? I don't know. Um, there will always be a demand for storytelling. Um, uh, and uh, in many different forms. But I think the public has basically said, We're, we've had it with this standardized stuff. We don't want this anymore. And um, uh, I don't see the internet as a savior. I see the internet as it, it, it has made it, it, it is just this sort of greater manifestation of the mechanization of mental activity and social engineering of an incredible kind by the way, if, if any of you have logged on and want to be a friend with me on Facebook, I'm, uh, please, my condolences. I, 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 I just I don't want to use that form of social media. I think it's probably 
the smartest way if you want to observe and track political behavior and movements in this world is just look at Facebook. I mean, George Orwell would be absolutely appalled. He'd say, stay off of it. So my, my, my apologies to all those who, folks who want to be my friends. And, um, <laughs> and I think, and I'd be, who are you? And, um, but anyway, um, but uh, the, the, one of the great consequences of the internet has been the cheapening of the word. And, um, and what, you know, whatever experience or that I might have gained over time uh, as a writer, as an observer, as a reporter, is now has no value. And that's okay. I mean, I'm not, I'm not going to sit down and, and cry great tears about that. I'm, I'm like the rest of the world. You know, you got to get on and move on, and we're in transition. And it's a wild ride. I don't know where it's all going to go. I'm extremely grateful that I still have the opportunity to write for a paper like the Taiyi. And, and, and Dave has, has shown that, look, there, there is a huge audience out there for stuff that is different, for, for, for truth-telling and for uncomfortable reporting, and which tells me that you know, there's a huge audience out there for, for different ways of thinking about things. But, but I, it, the, 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 that whole Noam Chomsky thing about manufacturing consent, um, which to my shame I didn't really understand for 20, 25 years, you know, what the hell is this radical socialist-like guy in the United States talking about? Because I'm a small-c social conservative, but he's right. It's all about manufacturing consent, and it is an industrial process. And like every other industrial process that has got really big, it is now cracking and falling apart. I think this would be a perfect time to invite you all in on the conversation. Um, I see uh, two uh, Taiyi people, uh, reporter Katie Hislop and editor Robin Smith are there. Could you help? Pass around microphones, maybe. If you came down here, I would. I think I could. Or this this guy's going to help you. Who would like to ask Andrew a question? Um, okay. Did you have to locate yourself right in the middle where it's the hardest to get the microphone to? Could you not have thought ahead of time? <laughs> Okay, yell one out. Let's try one without a mic. Um, yeah. Okay, this is becoming long, so now you need to use the microphone because otherwise we won't be able to record you. We're recording this event, and so we need your words to be recorded. I was going to sort of summarize your question into my microphone, <laughs> and I can't do that because that was heavily footnoted, what you just said. <laughs> the point is that it goes right back to John Stuart Mill. I'll speed up. Okay. It goes right back to John Stuart Mill, and yet the frustration that many of us feel who've got into this literature is that the university economics departments are still, almost to a man, resisting the introduction of ecological economic thinking, which is, which is much better grounded in physics and chemistry. All those good things that you said about Saudi and all those good things you said about energy return on investment and the entropy law and all of that is all built into a much better framework of economics and vested interests are preventing it being taught to generation after generation. Do you have any ideas about how we might move that one? Because I think that's part of the intellectual infrastructure for moving on here. Um, that's very much part of the problem. Um, I, I'm, a, I'm amazed, actually, at uh, what, when I started writing this book, and, and this book is really composed of voices um, that, have, that, we, that have been cut out of the discussion. And really important voices, like Frederick Soddy, or like the American sociologist Fred Cotterill, or like the American uh, energy expert Earl Cook, who you've not heard about, but who uh, are, are even alleged the Catholic theologian, but are, or the great Viennese economist Leopold Kor, the guy that, that taught uh, Schumacher that small was beautiful. And these are the voices and these are the individuals who have the ideas that we need at hand when the shit hits the fan. 
and and the fact that they have been excluded from university curriculums and I, and I don't think there's malice involved here I just think it's this profound ignorance and arrogance um, we don't know who these guys are we don't even know that there were all of these alternative conversations about energy um, and uh, now we must find them and resurrect them and and I hope a lot I if nothing else, my book introduces people to some of these extraordinary voices. Great. I think, did Adrian Carr are there, or the green politician, have a question? Yeah. <laughs> City councillor elected. City councillor elected. <laughs> um, yeah, I do, actually. Oh, sorry. Thanks very much. Yes, Adrian Carr. Um, I, you've got me th thinking about two things. One is, um, is the notion of change and your statement that people are unwilling to change you know you, you have to force them into it they've been well no i think people actually want to change but institutions and governments are locked into a system that's heavily invested in hydrocarbons okay so uh, times when we've seen immense change have been crises i'm thinking of the you know the stock market crash in 29 and the depression in which the government of the us actually put taxes of 70 or 80% on the incomes of higher income earners, um, we ended up with a, a, an amazing recycling, uh, using more fully and less wasteful practices on the ground, uh, wartime efforts which lead to that. Can you think of a crisis that might prompt change? Whoa. <laughs> <laughs> um, I think we're beginning to see it already. I mean, if you go to Spain, 40% unemployment. Greece, 30% unemployment. Um, there's a crisis uh, moving right through Europe. There's a similar crisis moving right through the United States. And, and, and a related crisis moving right through Japan. Our problem at the moment is we think this is a crisis about capital and markets, when in fact it is really a crisis about energy flows. And, and in that we do not even, even recognize. And um, so the first phase of the, of the energy crisis won't be something that we can identify as energy. It, 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 it's going to be all about the economics. And, uh, and I think when the Chinese economy begins to implode and as the American economy further stagnates, Canadians are going to have to face a few realities about who we are and what we're doing and where we're going to go. And, you know, and, 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 but each and every crisis is an opportunity to rethink about where you're going and what you are doing. But as long as traditional economists are, are the guys calling the shots, they're going to try to drive the car right off the cliff. And, um, but the crisis has begun. And, you know, and so that's the economic phase. Let's look at the atmospheric phase. You know, we have an ocean that is rapidly acidifying. We are losing our, all of the ice in the north. And, uh, you know, <laughs> uh, it's remarkable to me that we don't even regard that as a crisis. There it is. That should be on the front page of every newspaper every day, except they're in the business of manufacturing consent about ways of living that are dying. And, uh, and so there's another crisis. So, I don't, I, you know, so when people, what is it going to take to... to to really get going here, I don't know. It's going to take some pain, that's for sure. With your liberty, one other quick one, which mm -hmm. is about your idea of those who own the energy, whether it's slaves or fossil fuels, have the power. Do you think there's some notion to the renewables being very difficult to own by any concentrated sector like wind and solar? I is there something about the potential for democratization in that? There is. I mean, the, the, one of the reasons governments aren't keen on renewables is they haven't figured out how to, how to tax them or how to make a revenue off of them. Um, but we are, we are kind of industrializing renewables the same way we've industrialized every other thing in this, in this world. And if we approach renewables the same way we've approached hydrocarbons, we're not going to be much further ahead. We're not actually going to be able to solve uh, very many of these problems either. And we also have to recognize the limits of renewables. But absolutely, the, I mean, there are great opportunities for decentralizing and relocalizing energy production um, in communities. If, 
but we have to give communities a voice in that. And right now we're not prepared to do that. I've got 3,000 windmills south of my, of my land in southern Alberta, and no government, no company ever went and asked anyone in southern Alberta what, what, a, what they thought about an array, an industrial array of 3,000 windmills in their backyard. And by the way, you know, um, uh, anyway, but the, you know, and, and it's all foreign money, California money, to buy carbon credits in California, and, uh, and the public is supposed to pay for the transmission lines. Wrong model, wrong approach. Yeah. Um, so given that today, just like everything else, our food supply has become industrialized and, co and comes from hydrocarbons, like everything. So let's say climate change doesn't kill everybody and we actually manage to make the move away from hybrid carbons and we find we actually get down this road of sustainability that they're, they're calling. As the move away from oil and hydrocarbons happens, what's going to happen to our food supply? Because that's, that's a huge issue because obviously as humans we, we need food to live and yeah, what's going to happen? What do you think? Um, that's going to be another big crunch point for us, you know. So, Adrian, we get back to your what is going to be a crisis. Well, this is already a crisis here because we now have competing needs for our food supply. We have one sector that wants to turn it into fuel, okay, and we've got another sector that, that it is producing food with all these high energy inputs. And so, what happened uh, as a consequence of high energy inputs in the pig industry in Manitoba and Saskatchewan? Of course, we're going to cheap, produce all this cheap pork and send it to China. This industry is crashing because they can't afford green to feed their pigs as a consequence of rising fuel costs and for the production of these crops combined with drought, a signature of climate change. And in addition, and then you've got the ethanol lobby in the United States that is wants to um, use about a third of, of U.S. corn for biofuels. Now you take that dynamic and multiply it around the world and you can see that we're going to have um, some pretty profound challenges to our food supply, not to mention the rising costs of ammonia and, and uh, well, actually natural gas is pretty cheap right now, but at some point that, that won't last long. So we've got a, a, some really profound challenges there in addition to the fact that what we've done to agriculture is exactly what the British did with their plantation economies in the Caribbean. It's monocultures, it's not agriculture. And it's all determined by, it, you know, by these very high energy inputs, in this case by fossil fuels and their energy, energy slaves. And, um, and, and it's all about concentration again and standardization, so one crop, uh, one crop, one genetic property, um, no diversity. It's an industrial model that is is highly fragile and vulnerable. You know, as the uh, meatpacking plant in Brooks, Alberta, that is adding E. coli for free to everyone's beef. Back there. All, all the way in the back there. By the way, I think a really good future occupation for a lot of young people will be small farms. <laughs> After the revolution that, uh, that apportions all these giant farms into smaller plots, apparently. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> yes, so in the back. all this is being driven by humans, as far as I can tell. Um, it's not beavers. It's not, I don't know, mice. It's, uh, it's all of us, right? So uh, you talk about crisis. Isn't this a crisis of the human spirit? Um, we now have democracy. We have science up the yin-yang. I mean, we've got PhD theses to paper the earth. Uh, we have a rearview mirror. How, I is there any hope there? Can we think our way out of this is your question. Well, you know, are humans capable of changing their spiritual selves enough to make a difference at this point? I think that's a very good question. Not the fat guy again, please. Okay, good. 
He's getting his blood. This is a moral, a moral crisis. I mean, it, this, my book is really a bunch of moral and philosophical questions to which I don't have all the answers to. But I thought I would, you've raised it, I'm just going to read a, read a portion here. Um, because I think it answers what, what, you're, what you're asking. All energy issues are moral ones. The Christian philosopher C.S. Lewis grasped this fundamental truth with a gentle fierceness. In The Abolition of Man, Lewis wrote, Each new power won by man is a power over man as well. Each advance leaves him weaker as well as stronger. In every victory, besides being the general who triumphs, he is also the prisoner who follows the triumphal car. Lewis compared the modern fascination with power to an Irish folktale. When a fellow discovered that a certain kind of wood stove reduced his fuel bill by half, he ordered a second stove in order to warm his house with no fuel at all. It is the magician's bargain. Give up our soul, get power in return. But once our souls, that is, ourselves, have been given up, the power thus conferred will not belong to us. We shall, in fact, be the slaves and puppets of that to which we have given our souls. Yeah, I, uh, it seems to me that, that I mean, I like your, your metaphor of, of the energy slave, but it strikes me that we are more consumer slaves, and the energy is only part of that. And, and, and my pessimism is, how do we, I mean, I'm, I've been involved in social movements for 40 years, and my pessimism arises out of how do we create a movement that convinces people uh, to consume less. I mean, th that is the, that seems to me to be the key to energy reduction is a, is, a, is a cultural revolution where we recognize that all the stuff we buy doesn't actually make us happy and it's destroying the world until we come to grips with, with consumerism as, as a slavery. I don't think uh, that we'll get very far. And, and my pessimism, as I say, is how do we, how do we, I mean, it's the tragedy of the commons. And no one wants to reduce their consumption of stuff because they don't think anyone else will. Uh, and I don't know how we start that, uh, although to some extent people will be forced into it, I suppose. That, I, I agree with you. And, and I think the only way that we are going to stop some of that is, is most likely with a faith-based movement, much like abolition, was that is completely directed at our materialism. And uh, I think that's coming. Okay. Um, yes. Uh, well, sorry, Katie, that's going to be a long ways with the mic. But we haven't heard from anybody in the front yet, and I do want to be equitable. Front, front people need to be heard from, too. <laughs> Hi, um, I'm Fred Bass. Uh, I was uh, a politician once upon a time. I'm a preventive medicine physician. Um, it seems to me there's something more fundamental than energy, and that is ecosystems. Uh, now, you've hinted at the uh, ecological threats, uh, the Arctic disappearing, the acidification of ocean. There are a number of other ones that are, uh, but we are ecologically illiterate. We don't know our place in how things work. And there is an energy out there somewhere to be picked up without cost. So I wonder if you'd comment a little bit about how ecosystems fit into the way you look at things. OK. So the question is, OK, what about ecosystems? Is, is, it, is it energy They're the real critical issue here, or is it ecosystems? There are all kinds of natural flows of energy on the planet. And previous cultures and societies recognized these energy flows and lived by them and off them. 
the salmon culture of this province was all based on the energy of fish in the river systems of British Columbia and its abundance. And it, this energy was so rich and so profound that the coastal First Nations could spend so much of their time devoted to the extraordinary art and storytelling and just plain, plain living that they did. And, and these were cultures that thrived for a long, long time. And, you know, when you look at old cities, they were always located by rivers so that the food supply could flow down to the mouth of the river where the city was. Um, there was much more awareness of the natural world and of its limitations and what we could tap into as a species. What we've profoundly done with hydrocarbons and energy slaves is that we somehow think, okay, we don't have to think about the wind anymore. We don't have to think about the heat in the atmosphere. We don't have to think about ocean currents. We can re-engineer everything to suit our needs with the power we have with our energy slaves. And so in the process, we've become increasingly illiterate, Not, but also about energy because it's been so cheap. Um, but we have behaved as, as abusively as Roman masters did to their slaves in, in Rome. But here, you know, we're not torturing people. We're not shackling people. We're not turning them into servants. We're not um, humiliating them and defiling them. Now we're talking about humiliating and defiling and putting into subservience entire landscapes and ecosystems. And then we wonder why they are collapsing why they no longer have any vitality, why they have lost all of their diversity. And, um, and this is why I think big oil hates the environmental movement so strongly. Because it was Rachel Carson who in the 1960s had the courage to point out, we're doing something wrong here. We're using our energy in a profoundly destructive way to re-engineer landscapes solely to suit our whims the way a plantation owner would, would uh, play with his slave population, even to the point of wanting to control how they procreate and reproduce. And that is our biggest problem, is again, it comes back to energy. We don't know how to use energy wisely and we have used it to destroy forests, deltas, groundwater, ocean currents, and we have now constructed so many machines. And like I, I, I always come across people in Canada who say, you know, oh, climate change, Andrew, what are you talking about? And I say, guys, put a diesel generator in your living room and turn it on and watch the temperature, watch the thermostat in your living room, and you tell me how long you can live in those conditions. And then imagine that same phenomenon for the whole planet. And then when you read someone like Jim Hansen, and I think, you know, maybe scientists have not explained this right, but they've, you know, Jim Hansen talks about climate change as a fundamental change in the energy flow of the whole planet by this overheating. So, I think that answers a bit of your question. Um, back up, <laughs> apparently, sorry. Katie, I owe you a drink after this. <laughs> um, the woman there in the, on the edge there. Yeah. yeah I'm not a woman. Oh, I'm sorry. <laughs> <laughs> Jeff Dembecki, who works with me, and I called him a woman. There's going to be trouble tomorrow at the, at the Taiye. But your hair looks particularly nicely coiffed tonight, Jeff. <laughs> I'll get <him> a drink, too. <laughs> <laughs> and I, I owe a lot of drinks by the end of tonight, yeah. Okay, so there's something that's always confused me about global warming, and it's the fact that there seems to really be two narratives um, 
about it, and one is the narrative that you've explained quite well, which is the narrative of conflict, of governments um, not wanting to make changes that are necessary for a low carbon transition, oil companies not willing to give up their profits, environmentalists having to fight back against that. So that's, that's one story that we hear over and over again. Um, but the, the other narrative I'm, I'm hearing more, of these day, more and more of these days is, is one of transition, and it's the fact that the U.S. was the biggest spender on renewable energy and clean technology last year on the planet, ahead of Europe, ahead of China, and, and has been for some time. And, and the fact that clean technology, renewable energy is a $1 trillion market and by 2020 could be worth more than, than the pharmaceutical industry. But the, I, I find the more time I, I spend looking at either narrative, the less I'm aware of the other. The people who are talking about transition are not really um, talking about tar sands or, or the Harper government, except when Harper does something really egregious to screw them. Um, and, and vice versa, when, when you talk about tar sands, for instance, and, and you engage someone about that, there's not really any discussion of, 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 what, of what the alternatives are. And I'm, I'm just wondering how you s square those, those two narratives. Hmm. You're right, Jeff. I mean, they're often presented as different narratives, even though they're, they're all interconnected. Um, the story about renewables as interesting and significant as it is, it's still enormously um, small in the scheme of things. It, it's not going to scale up for 20, 30, 40 years. So that, that's, that's one story. Climate change, on the other hand, seems to be scaling up every year. And scaling up in ways that are pretty profound and unpredictable and that are shocking the hell out of a lot of scientists. Again, the media is not really telling that story. The urgency of that story is nowhere to be found. And, um, and, and so we're, 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 we're in, we're, we're, we are in almost in these kind of lazy days where we think that oh, you know, someone will come up with some kind of great new technology that will save us all, and there'll be a magic bullet, and, and won't it be marvelous? Um, when, in fact, this kind of ad hoc approach to renewables, which is really, you know, and you just remember my graph, that 1% of the world's power is now generated by renewables. Just think of the amount of oil we will have to spend because the, each and every windmill and every solar panel comes embedded in oil to replace that infrastructure that already exists. And can we do that in a time frame to avoid a total meltdown of the climate that would take us on a trajectory to becoming another Venus? Um, there's no sense of urgency and there's no sense of moral leadership. And, but among ordinary people, there's a high degree of discomfort about, about that state of affairs. And so this is why there is conflict about these pipelines. This is why there is conflict about the pace and scale of the tar sands. This is why there's going to be unending conflict about all of these energy projects in the future. Um, Yeah, I hope I answered that question. Um, yeah, thanks for the last part there. Um, pretty well um, says what Jim Hansen has been saying about renewables. He calls it the green Kool-Aid, by the way. Now, um, you're a little bit inaccurate in kind of misquoting Jim Hansen on nuclear power. Um, most of the things you said about nuclear power are inaccurate or incorrect completely. Um, the last 10 
or the last seven can-do reactors built were all on time, all on budget. They came in at $2 billion a gigawatt, which is about, about two cents, less than two cents a kilowatt hour. So nuclear power is actually the cheapest form of power we have available to us, and that is demonstrated in recent builds. For example, there's a build right now going on in North Carolina, and that build is VC Summer. Its cost is four billion a gigawatt, which works out to about about four cents a kilowatt hour if public power built it. And that is twice the cost of building exactly the same reactors in China. They are almost ready to almost ready for service. So if you look at all the money that has been spent on renewables to date since since they started tracking it, since Bloomberg started tracking it, if you had built nuclear instead we would now be coal-free in the world. We would now be in radioactive and, and that is also incorrect, incorrect again. All the world's nuclear waste would fit on a single football field. A single football field. It, 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 you could take that football field and put it out. Right now they've got a big pile of arsenic in the north that's a lot bigger than that football field, and that will kill people for 100 million years. Okay, so... It, Okay, it's hard to conduct a conversation. It's sort of like a, a non, non-digitally aided Twitter debate, like because people are just sort of putting out 140 word characters at each other, and I understand that impulse. But let's let Andrew uh, maybe address uh, this comment. Every form of energy we want to use comes with with costs and sacrifices and problems. And, um, and each and every form of energy out there comes with its own lobby groups, its own you know, promoters, its own, you've got shale gas people here and nuclear over there and you've got renewables over here. But I will still bring it all back that if we don't solve this fundamental issue of what we use energy for, we are going to be no better off with nuclear renewables or shale gas or whatever else comes along. We still haven't, as a people, had the conversation that we should have about justice and equity and using energy wisely. Okay. So we've got time for one more. How about this person right here? Okay. Um, I just wanted to um, come back on that last statement because I don't know if I'm understanding you correctly in saying that you're saying that energy flow is actually separate from the current economic crisis or from the economic system um, because I don't think we can actually separate them because your last point just made me realize that what you're talking about is when we're talking about what we use energy for and how we're using it and we haven't had this discussion maybe it's because we don't really want to admit that the way that we're living the system that we're living under the way that we um, are living in a system that's based on growth and growth and buying new things and and it, it's constantly in a linear projection as opposed to a circular yeah. use of things that maybe what we're saying is we actually need to create something that is new and that is different and is utterly sustainable and something that you mentioned about individual people and I think it's your own view coming through as well about quality versus quantity and um, living in the moment versus distraction um, is, do you believe that's actually possible with the current, um, I guess you could say, world economic setup the way it is? Or do we actually need to have a real like, wholesale change into something that is completely different and really reformat the way that we're thinking and looking at the world, both politically and energy-wise and economically and everything else? Okay. Um, your first part where you're talking about energy flows and, and the economy. I'm, the point I'm trying to make is that energy flows are directly related to how economies function. And what we are beginning to, to experience right now 
as energy becomes more expensive, particularly as extreme hydrocarbons become more expensive, we will see a contraction in our economies. And we will be scratching our heads and wondering what it's all about. And so far, we haven't identified the real issue at hand, which is that the hydrocarbons we want to use are, 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 are becoming more extreme and more expensive. And the beginning of the energy transition is going to be an economic crisis, pure and simple. Your next part of your question is, OK, so then what do we do? I mean, we, we, are, we, we have constructed an enormously complicated society that is so dependent on the employment of energy slaves, um, fueled largely by hydrocarbons. What we cannot manage at the moment is the complexity. <coughs> and, um, and a lot of people are just walking away from that. Because they realize that change is not going to start with big government. It's not going to certainly start in big corporations. And we know that big oil is going to stop. Um, it's going to fight any change every inch of the way because they have too much invested in a system they helped build over 100 years. The real change will begin as all change begins with individuals and communities deciding to do things differently. It will begin like abolition with 14 people in a room with the strongest of beliefs saying, this will stop. And we will live differently. And you know what? They actually did. I mean, one of the most incredible things about abolition was the slaveholders would say, no, wait a moment, guys. You're questioning our economic lifestyle. I mean, if you drink tea and you put sugar in your tea, what the hell are you talking? I mean, that sugar was raised by a slave and harvested and refined by a slave. If you, if you uh, or I've got cotton on your back, well, we know who picked that cotton. So you can't ask these questions. And the abolitionists said, then we won't drink tea. We won't put sugar in it either. And one of the most profound boycotts in England was a boycott of sugar. Sugar planters got the message pretty quick. And things started to change. So I think a lot of change is going on already. It's not detectable. It's not always profound, it's not on a huge, huge scale, but it is beginning among individuals, particularly in your generation, to saying, you know, what the hell is all this about? What the hell do I need a car for? But you know what, I'm going to plant myself in a community where I don't need all these machines and where I'm with like-minded people whose human energy and love I can depend upon and where we can concentrate on the quality of our lives doing good work on a small scale where we live, enjoying every moment. Because this system is, you can fight it all you want, all your life. And when it falls, it will fall as quickly as a forest that has been invaded by bark beetles. It will flip like you have never seen anything flip before. And you must be ready for that moment with new energy, fresh ideas, a good heart, and able hands. Thank you, Andrew Nickafark. <laughs> Thank you for writing Energy of Slaves. Thank you for sharing your insights for three years on the TIE and for being here this evening. Um, thank you, everybody, for your excellent questions. I wish we had the time and the energy to go on longer, but I'm, I'm afraid we don't, and this is Andrew's third straight night of doing this. Um, however, uh, I do want to say uh, that um, energy, the energy of slaves is available for uh, sales uh, as you exit the theater, and Andrew will be there. <laughs> to autograph books. Um, thank you, Robin and Katie, for running up and down the steps. 
Sorry about that, Jeff Dumbecki. Um, thank you, uh, SFU and Van City, for uh, helping to uh, make this event possible. And once again, thank you very much, Andrew Nickelfort. Yeah.